Okay, folks, now we're going to focus on T lymphocytes. And some of the, the aspects that we're going to cover uh, include um, T, cell T cell receptor diversity, basically high T cells achieve T, T cell receptor diversity. And it's done in a similar way to B cell receptor, in a similar manner to the way which B cells achieve um, B cell receptor diversity through the the process of somatic recombination, junctional diversity. And then we're going to also talk about the role for major histocompatibility complex in antigen presentations for T cells. And then we're going to talk about the role of CD4 and CD8 T cells. And later on, we'll, we'll give an overview of the processes involved in T cell maturation. But we'll start off with the basics for um, T cell antigen recognition. So, as you know, as, as previously discussed, T cells will not recognize antigen unless the antigen is presented to it by, uh, on major histocompatibility complex uh, 1 or 2. Okay, so let's start with MHC1. So MHC1 is expressed in every cell in your body, um, and it presents antigen that exists within the cell. Okay, so for instance, it's well established that viruses um, tend to infect the cell and it exists within a cell. And therefore, viruses would be uh, presented on MHC1. And when they're presented on the surface of the cell on MHC1, the T cell that it, that it will interact with is a CD8 cell. Of course, the reason for this is, is the fact that MHC1 presents endogenous antigens such as a virus. We know that CD8 cells are specialized in dealing with viral infection. Okay, so that's the, the first scenario, MHC1. Now, in terms of MHC2, one thing that we have to appreciate is that MHC2 is generally expressed on, on a specialized set of cells called antigen-presenting cells. Okay, and these include B cells, macrophages, and the most... Uh, effective dendri the most effective antigen presenting cell dendritic cells okay so dendritic cells are critical to antigen presentation of exogenous antigen okay so antigen presenting cells will express exogenous antigen on mhc2 on the surface of the cell and when they express the the antigen on mhc2 at the surface of the cell that will result in the interaction with cd4 cells Okay, and as we discussed previously, CD4 cells are helper T cells. Okay, and we'll cover a little bit more about, about this uh, at a later stage. Okay, now this table just summarizes the differences between the two receptors and their uses um, and the molecules involved in, in antigen presentation. Okay, so that's the that's the general concept of antigen presentation. There are exceptions where um, where the antigen presentation can be direct, as we've previously discussed, but it can also be uh, through a process called cross presentation, where uh, an infected cell, for instance, dies, and parts of those components get taken up exogenously by a dendritic cell and presented on MHC one. Um, to the to the T cell. But let's now focus on major histocompatibility complex. So the major function of major histocompatibility complex is of course to present degraded antigen or epitope to T cells to enable T cells to recognize the antigen. And as we said, T cells just don't have the ability to interact with the antigen unless it's presented to them on MHC. And this whole concept of the T cells necessity to have the antigen broken down, processed, and presented on MHC molecules is referred to as MHC restriction. Okay, and the class of MHC or MHC1, as you know, um, which presents antigen existing inside the cell, such as a virus, but it could also be a transform uh, protein from a tumor. Okay. So MHC1 also presents um, antigens from, from transformed cells or from cancer cells. 
or as MHC2 will present antigen obtained from outside the cell, which generally speaking will be extracellular bacteria, but it could also be uh, virus particles that, ha that are traveling between cells that are taken up and presented. So that's something to take into consideration. And we'll cover a wee bit more about this in, like, in week four. So in terms of major histocompatibility complex genes, they're hi highly polymorphic. And one of the reasons for them being highly polymorphic is that if a pathogen manages to evade the antigen presenting uh, process, if every, every individual in the population has a different version of the major histocompatibility complex, then the, the, um, the risk that the whole population will, will, um, will, will suffer from this is reduced by the fact that each individual has a different, slightly different version of that gene. Okay, so just to consider, yes, major histocompatibility complex genes are polymorphic. Now, a little bit more focus on MHC1. So MHC1 um, is composed of an alpha um, component and a beta 2 microglobulin component. So the alpha transmembrane peptide contains three subunits, alpha 1, 2, and 3, and beta 2 microglobulin, as you can also see here. Okay, and as we've said previously, you know, when you express MHC1, it will tend to associate with CD8 cells. So here you see the surface of a, a CD8 T cell, and that CD8 uh, receptor locks in with MHC1. So MHC1 molecules tend to associate with CD8 cells. And again, just to highlight that MHC1 tends to be expressed in all nucleated cells in your body, uh, with the exception is they're, they're not highly expressed in and uh, nerve cells in the CNS, and that's to protect the nerve cells from uh, excessive immune response. Um, and the rationale that all nucleated cells express MHC1 is the fact that if every cell is at risk of, a, of being infected by a virus, then every cell needs to have that ability to communicate with the immune system that in fact has an infection. That's why all MHC, all uh, cells in your body generally express MHC1. Now, in terms of antigen presenting of MHC1, I'm going to take you through the process, and we're going to use the virus as an example. So this is a scenario where an infected cell expresses MHC1 with the viral epitope attached in order to stimulate a CD8 response. Okay, so. Here we have the, the cell. The virus infects the cell and it starts to undergo the process of infection and replication. And during that process, it'll produce, use the, use the R cells machinery to um, produce viral messenger RNA and subsequently use our transcription machinery to produce viral protein. Now, before we go any further, I have to highlight that the cell has uh, an organelle present in the cell called the proteasome. Now, in normal circumstances, the proteasome is there to break down um, proteins that are no longer usable by the cells um, into single amino acids so that we can break down proteins that aren't required anymore and recycle the amino acids within those proteins. Okay, so that's a proteasome. The difference is in this process when the viral um, antigen needs to be broken down to isolate the, the epitope, it's processed through a version of the proteasome called an immunoproteasome. And the function of an immunoproteasome is to degrade the viral proteins. But the reason it's specialized is it will not degrade the viral proteins and the amino acids because if it degrades the, the viral protein and the amino acids, then the cell has no way of presenting the epitope. So what the immunoproteasome does is breaks down the viral proteins into short segments of between 8 to 12 amino, amino acids in length so, that, so that, that that short segment will contain the epitope that is a region of the viral protein that the immune system will recognize. So the viral proteins are processed by the immunoproteasome and the 
the protein, or sorry, the enzyme that stops the viral protein being fully degraded into amino acids is called heat shock protein. Okay, so the immunoproteasome use heat shock proteins to prevent the full degradation of the viral protein and the amino acids. And through this process, we get the breakdown of the viral protein into short segments between 8 to 12 amino acids long um, in order to isolate the epitope. So here you see the immunoproteasome is broken down into short segments. And you can see the short segments um, here, and you can notice that it contains the epitope within it, the red segment. Okay? And what then happens is the short peptide segments of the viral antigen will then make their way towards the endoplasmic reticulum. And in the endoplasmic reticulum, it enters the endoplasmic reticulum through a receptor called TAP. Okay, so you can see that it enters through TAP. So a summary of that first step is the endogenous antigen, the virus infects the cell, and that, that uh, viral uh, protein or antigen is degraded by the immunoproteasome. And it's degraded through the help of heat shock proteins, which prevent the full degradation of the amino acids um, to enable the peptide or epitope to be isolated for presentation. This, sh this short segment of peptide then makes its way to the endoplasmic reticulum and enters through the receptor top. Now, that whole process is, is, is undergoing, uh, uh, while that whole process is, is ongoing, in the endoplasmic reticulum, the MHC molecule, in this case MHC1, is starting to undergo the process of assembly. Okay, As I said previously, MHC1 is composed of an alpha uh, component and a beta 2 microglobulin. Now at this stage of the assembly, we don't require beta 2 microglobulin. Okay? Uh, but at this stage, we also want to try and, and start to assemble the MHC1 molecule. So, the issue we have is the alpha component um, of the MHC molecule has a tendency to aggregate on itself. And this is a problem because what we want to do is slot in the beta-2 microglobulin, uh, but the problem is the, um, the alpha subunit is aggregating on itself, making it impossible for the beta-2 microglobulin Deintegrate and form MHC1. So, what we need are chaperones. And what these chaperones will do will, will uh, form temporary bonds with the alpha subunit to enable the alpha subunit to, to prevent this, the alpha subunit from aggregating. Essentially, what the chaperones do is hold up the, M, the MHC alpha unit to enable beta 2 megalob problem to slot in. What are these chaperones? They're called connect Calnexin and ERP57. Okay, so here you see, seeing that the, the previous slide, you can see that the alpha subunit was folded over, but through the help of Calnexin and ERP57, the alpha subunit is now sitting upright and is now in a position where beta-2 microglobulin can get access and bond to the alpha subunit. Okay, so here you see micro two, beta 2 microglobulin is able to slot in. And when it slots in, it causes a conformational change. And when, the, when that conformational change occurs, it reveals the peptide binding group. Okay, as you can see here, the peptide binding cleft that it's referred to there. Now, what this enables is for the, the, anti, the peptide broken down from the viral antigen will now slot in to this, this region of the MHC1 molecule. But after this process, we then need to switch up the chaperones. So Calnexin is replaced by Calreticulin. Okay, and then after that, a very important component of this whole peptide loading complex gets involved, and that's called Tapacin. And what Tapacin does is, it, it brings in all the components of the MHC1 assembly complex, and, and it, it associates that complex in close alignment with TAP1 and TAP2, i.e. the TAP receptor. Now, the rationale for this is that while when the viral peptide is entering the endoplasmic reticulum, we need to help, 
we need to help facilitate this this addition of the viral peptide to the peptide binding groove in the most efficient manner possible. So Tapasin brings everything together so that when the peptide arrives, the peptide will enter through top and Tapasin will help facilitate the, um, the addition of that peptide to the peptide binding group. Okay, and at that point, uh, Tapasin has helped facilitate this process of the peptide loading complex and the addition of the peptide. And after the peptide is added, that peptide, peptide loading complex then disassembles. Okay, and when it disassembles, then MHC1 with the viral peptide uh, or epitope is then packed up in a neat, neat little package in the Golgi apparatus and then is subsequently transformed or transported in a physical to the cell surface. Okay, so as we said before, we, we the viral virus infected the cells, uh, virus get broke down, viral proteins get broke down by the immunoproteasome in the peptides. It then entered the endoplasmic reticulum through TAP. The MHC1 assemb uh, uh, complex was assembled. Tapasin then brought this peptide loading complex together and the peptide was added, loaded onto the MHC1. The MHC1 then made its way to the endoplasmic reticulum uh, and was put into a physical and it then made its way to the cell surface. Now, now that the MHC1 is on the surface presenting the viral uh, epitope or antigen, component of the antigen, um, it then interacts with CD8 cells. So an activated CD8 cell, which has also received, uh, also interacted with the antigen in the lymph node, then makes its way to the infected cell. And when it makes its way to the infected cell, one of the issues we have is how does the CD8 cell know where to go? i.e. if it's in a lymph node, how does it know to go to a specific region in the tissue where the virus uh, takes place? Well, the reason it knows how to do this is through a process called chemotaxis. Okay, so the infected cell starts to produce interferon and the CD8 cells will be attracted to that region by the interferon. Therefore, the CD8 cell essentially gets a, 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 is able to track its way to the infected cell and when it arrives, um, one thing that it needs to do is interact with the MHC. Now, if, for instance, this was a flu virus infection, if this T cell is not, does not have a T cell receptor that recognizes flu virus, then it will not interact with the MHC1. But if we do have a T cell that, that has a T cell re receptor that recognizes the flu virus, for example, in this case, then it will make its way towards the MHC1. Its T cell receptor will interact with MHC1. It will recognize that, yes, indeed, it is the antigen that this T cell recognizes. And at that point, it will uh, become, uh, it will initiate its lytic uh, processes and release perforin and granzyme. And what the perforin will do will punch little holes in the membrane of the infected cell and it will subsequently also release granzyme and the whole the concept here is that the granzyme will then degrade the cellular contents of the cell including the virus and and at the end of that process what you have is the infected cell has been destroyed okay so that's how mhc1 presentation works in relation to an infected cell okay now, so a quick summary is that the calnexin is replaced by recovered reticulin. Tapasin stabilizes the peptide loading complex uh, through binding DRP57. Tapasin then stabilizes TAP and brings everything together to enable the MHC1 to be close to the flow of incoming antigen. Uh, just to reiterate, the peptide loading complex is Tapasin, calvert reticulin, ERP57, TAP, and MHC1. And of course, Tapasin then helps facilitate the, the addition of the, the antigen or epitope of, onto the peptide binding group.
And then the addition of the peptide to the MHC1 leads to the dissociation of the peptide loading complex. And the MHC1 loaded with peptide is then transferred to the surface. At that point, the activated C cell arriving from the lymph node, who's, which is trying to find out which cell is infected, will then interact with MHC1. It will release its perforin and granzyme, and you then get cell lysis. Okay, folks, so that's MHC1 presentation. We're going to move on to MHC2. Now, as I said previously, MHC2 is expressed on a limited number of cells. Okay? It's expressed in professional antigen pre presenting cells, including dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. Now, one thing to highlight that the most efficient uh, antigen presenting cell is a dendritic cell. A dendritic cell basically goes between lymph node and tissue, um, collecting antigen, bringing it to the lymph node, and presenting the antigen to T cell. Okay, that is the job of a dendritic cell. So a dendritic cell is is generally the cell that will initiate an adaptive response. Okay, so what does an MHC molecule look like? So it has an alpha subunit and a beta sub subunit. Okay, or sorry, an alpha chain and a beta chain. And there are different versions of MHC2. You have HLA, DP, DQ, and DR. And depending on which uh, version of that you have, it can influence your risk of things like autoimmunity. But we'll cover that at a later stage. So as I said previously, the, the, when an uh, antigen-presenting cell expresses MHC2 with the, the antigen attached, or the peptide attached, it will interact with CD4 T cells. So as you can see again, the CD4 receptor or ligand will lock in with MHC2, and then that, that's one of the reasons why MHC2 will interact with CD4 cells specifically. Now, in terms of the process of antigen presentation, of course, it's slightly different from the endogenous pathway. So here you have an exogenous antigen, and it's taken up by the cell uh, through endocytosis, and uh, the antigen is trapped in an endosome. And what then happens is the endosome uh, starts to get degraded through acidic proteases within the endosome. And when it gets degraded, it does so in a way that it's trying to isolate the epitope. While all this is happening, um, MHC2 is being produced in the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the problem we have here is that we don't want endogenous antigen to be attached to MHC2. So to get MHC2 to the endosome, we need to protect it from other uh, peptides from inside the cell attaching. And that's the role of invariant chain. And what invariant chain will do is it will cover the peptide binding group of MHC2. Um, and at that point then, it will enter a vesicle and it will enter the Golgi, uh, pack, get packaged in a vesicle and make its way towards the endosome. When it fuses with the endosome, um, it will start to go through the processes of breaking down the invariant chain to, to um, make it easier for peptide or epitope to be added to MPC2. And that's the job of catechismin S. And uh, catechismin S will break down the invariant chain uh, to, to produce the... the um, to make it easier for the, the MHC2 to be added to the, um, the MHC2, for the antigen to be added to the MHC2. Okay, so the, as I said, Cassis Vaness will break down the invariant chain, um, and, but it will leave a, a component over the MHC2, which is called clip. Okay. And this component then makes its way to the MHC2 loading compartment uh, or differentiates into the MHC2 loading compartment. At that point, the HLA uh, DM will help facilitate the removal of clip and the subsequent addition of the antigen. And at that point, then the, the MHC2 is loaded with the, the the exogenous antigen um, epitope, if you like, and that is subsequently transported to the surface. And when it's transported to the surface, 
then it will interact, it will be recognized and interact with the specific CD4 T cell that recognizes that antigen. Okay, folks? Now, so that, that is how antigen is presented to T cells. I'm going to very briefly go over the generation of T cell diversity. Um, as I said, it's very similar to the, the, the manner in which B cells are able to generate their own unique uh, receptors. Um, and generally speaking, of course, most T cells that express T cell receptors uh, I I involving alpha and beta subunits. But there is a small population that expresses um, T cells that express gamma and delta subunits. So, and the, the, some of those uh, T cell subtypes have been implicated in some diseases, again, which could be covered later. Um, and basically, it's the same, the same concept. The alpha and beta subunit in this case has a constant region and a variable region. And in the variable region, for instance, the alpha chain, you've been in J regions, uh, whereas the, the variable region in the, um, in the beta chain has VD and J regions. So the whole concept is very similar uh, to B cell receptor gene rearrangement. T cells also go through a process of positive and negative selection, which we'll cover a little bit, uh, in a little bit more detail. But the positive selection aspect um, of T cell receptor gene rearrangement, or sorry, T cell uh, development, involves checking that the T cell receptor gene rearrangement has been successful. And another aspect is the negative selection is where it checks to make sure that the T cell receptor does not react against self antigen. Um, okay, and when a T cell receptor becomes activated, um, the the component that activates the cell. Um, the signal molecule that activates the cell is called CD3. Okay, and these are basically just the um, the numbers, if you like, in relation to the number of different segments within the genes for the alpha and beta subunits. And again, you have this concept of junctional diversity in relation to um, achieving vast uh, degree of, of variability of the T cell receptor. Okay, so that's that's uh, how the T cell um, achieves uh, T cell receptor diversity and uh, a vast T cell receptor repertoire. Um, but now we're going to move on to T cell receptor or T cell development. Now T cell development occurs in the thymus. So at this stage, we should appreciate that pre T cells are produced in the bone marrow, and they subsequently migrate from the bone marrow to the thymus. And it's in the thymus where the T cells undergo this process of maturation. Okay. And essentially what happens is the, the T cells arrive as a double negative thymocyte. Now what I mean by a double negative thymocyte is that they don't express CD4 or CD8. Okay. So they arrive expressing neither CD4 or CD8. And upon arrival, the, the T cell will start to undergo T cell receptor gene rearrangement. Once it's went through that process of gene rearrangement, um, it will then start to express both CD4 and CD8. And we refer to that as a double positive T cell. Okay. And what then happens is the double positive C T cell then migrates its migrates down towards the, the, the regions in the cortex, and it starts to interact with the cortical epithelial cells. Okay, and this is an important part of T cell maturation. The cortical epithelial cells will express both MHC1 and MHC2. And what will then happen is the double positive T cell will try to interact with the MHC1 or MHC2. And if this T cell it interacts with MHC1 on the cortical epithelial cell, it will get a signal to survive. And it will get a signal to survive um, 
on the one hand, and it'll also get a signal to become a CD itself. Okay, and at that point, if the T cell interacts with MHC1, it gets a signal to survive, it gets a signal to become a CD itself, and at that point, it stops producing CD4 on its circuit. On the other hand, if the, if the T cell interacts with MHC2, it will get a signal to survive, and it will also get a signal to downregulate CD8. At that point, it becomes a CD4 cell. Okay, so at the end of that process, uh, a, 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 a T cell will either become a CD4 or a CD8 cell, depending on which MHC it interacts with. But the other scenario is that if it doesn't interact with MHC at all, it won't get that positive signal to survive, and it will undergo cell death. Okay, and that's called negative selection. Another aspect that, that also takes place is that if it interacts too strongly with the MHC, it'll get a signal to die. Okay, so you have to appreciate that as well. Now, at the end of that process, it then can make its way out of the cortex and migrate down to the cortical medullary uh, uh, boundary and medulla. Okay, and when it migrates down here, uh, it has the opportunity to interact with two types of cells. It can interact with the medullary epithelial cell, or it can interact with the medullary uh, dendritic cell. Okay, and each of these cells will test the the, uh, the, the T cells to ensure that they don't react against self antigen. Okay? And that process is called negative selection. So these single positive T cells, CD4 or CD8, will interact with the cortical, with the, um, sorry, the medullary dendritic cells or with the medullary epithelial cells. And both of those, both of those cells, cell subsets, will check to ensure that that, that cell does not um, to ensure that that cell does not react against self antigen. If it does react against self antigen, those cells will receive a signal to die and that's called negative selection. It's also called central tolerance and again we'll cover this at a later stage. Now if if um, the, the CD4, CD8 cell does not cause an adverse reaction against self-antigen, then it, it is in the position to then leave the thymus and make its way towards the lymph node. And what that is then referred to, for instance, if it's a CD8 cell that has gone through these checks and is leaving to migrate to, to the lymph node, it's called a, a, a naive, mature CD8 cell. If it's a, a, a CD4 cell, it's referred to as a naive, mature CD4 cell. Now, what's the naive aspect mean? The naive aspect means that we have a mature T cell, but that it has not been activated by uh, antigen that it's due to target yet. Okay? So at the end of this process, it leaves the thymus after that rigorous series of rigorous checks and makes its way towards the lymph Okay, so in summary, we should appreciate that only being T cells that express a B cell or T cell receptor that works will get a signal to survive, um, and that is referred to as positive selection. Any B or T cell receptor that uh, binds to self antigen will get a signal to die, and that's called negative selection, and that's part of central tolerance. Where central tolerance for B cells occurs in the bone, Central tolerance or negative selection for T cells occurs in the thymus. If the result of negative selection is to generate a population of mature lymphocytes that don't react against self antigen, um, and this process of immunological unresponsiveness to antigen or self antigen is called tolerance. Um, and most individual B cell selection and T cell selection ensures that our lymphocytes are tolerant to self antigen. Of course, when you lose that tolerance to self-antigen, 
that's when you get the development and progression of autoimmune. Okay, now, so the B and T cells have now made their way uh, from the bone marrow or the thymus to the, the lymph node, okay? And these mature lymphocytes leave the, their primary lymphoid organs, uh, the bone or lymph node, um, and make their way towards secondary organs such as the spleen and lymph node. For B cells to go to the spleen, then go to the lymph node. And it's the secondary organs that T and B cells will encounter antigen for the first time in terms of activation. And it's there that they will proliferate in response to the antigen. And uh, it's also there where the B and T cells will start to interact with each other. Now, prior to encounter with a particular antigen, our body will have a small number of lymphocytes that are capable of responding against the antigen. But what then happens is, following antigen exposure, these lymphocytes will then proliferate exponentially so that we have enough of these antigen-specific cells to respond against the antigen in question. So this is generally what happens. So we have our B, T, B and T cells uh, that go between, that, that basically will, will be in the lymph nodes uh, awaiting for antigen to arrive. Um, but the, this is where the dendritic cell comes into, into its own. Because what the dendritic cell will do is go out to the tissue, collect antigen, then migrate to the lymph node and interact with the T cells. And the T cells will then help to activate B cells as well. For B cell activation, what will happen is the antigen itself will make its way, will make its way to the lymph node and will bind to the B-cell receptor and activate the B-cell, and that's how the B-cell process will be stimulated. Okay. So, one thing we need to appreciate is that there are different regions in the lymph node. Here you have a T-cell area called the PAR cortex. So this is generally where B-T-cells will be found. And you also have the cortex where, generally speaking, B-cells will be found. But in order for us to get an effective adaptive response, at some point, the B and T cells will need to talk to each other for an effective response. And when a B cell does become activated, we need to appreciate that it will make its way to the follicle and go through a germinal center reaction, which we covered previously. Now, the first step in any adaptive response is T cell activation, generally speaking. Okay, and it'll, it'll, it'll involve CD4 cell activation. Now, in order for a CD4 cell to become activated, two things need to happen, okay? The antigen presenting cell, in this case, say, for instance, the dendritic cell, presents the antigen to the T cell, okay? So the T cell uses its T cell receptor to recognize the antigen bound to MHC, and in this case, it's MHC2, and the CD4 will lock in the MHC and T cell receptor to, to form this presentation complex. Now, when that happens and you get effective recognition, that is referred to as signal one. Okay? But the problem we have is that for a T cell to become activated, it needs two signals. Okay? And that signal is derived from the binding of CD8 to B7, CD8 on the T cell, to B7 in the antigen presenting cell. And when those two ligands bind together, CD, CD28 will subsequently send a signal into the cell, and that will provide signal 2. And when you get signal 1 and signal 2, we have effective T cell activation. Okay? If you don't get signal 1 and signal 2, you will not get effective T-cell activation. And we'll cover what can happen if you don't get signal one. If you get signal one, but not signal two, or if you get signal two, but not signal one later on. But what you need to take from this slide is you need both signals for a T-cell to become active. Now, this is where the immunology gets even more complicated. So, we have to appreciate that when the, the, when the T-cell has never encountered antigen, it's referred to a naive T cell, which you can see here. It's referred to T 
t hits p or in some cases refer to t hits zero. So this T cell is awaiting for the antigen that its T cell receptor can recognize to be presented to. So what happens is the dendritic cell collects that antigen, brings it to the naive T cell in the lymph node, presents it on MHC2 to this naive CD4 T cell, and when it presents that antigen to the naive CD4 T cell, um, it gets signal 1 and it gets signal 2. But now the T cell faces a dilemma. Yes, it's activated, but this T cell needs to receive information for the dendritic cell in relation to the properties of the antigen that's being presented. Now, of course, the dendritic cell has been to the site of infection and it's picked up some signals in relation to what might be the best or most appropriate um, immune response against this antigen. So the antigen cell comes, the antigen cell presents the antigen, gives signal one, signal two, but it also produces growth factors and cytokines to provide some instructions to the naive T cell as to what might be the most appropriate response against this particular antigen. When that activated T cell then receives those signals, it has a number of options. If the dendritic cell provides its signals uh, such as IL-12, that naive C T cell will differentiate into a T helper cell 1, a TH1 cell. Now, in this scenario, the dendritic cell has picked up a viral antigen, instructed the T cell, look, there's a virus, uh, we have a viral infection, you need to become or differentiate into a TH1 cell because we know that a TH1 cell is most appropriate for a viral response. And that TH1 cell will subsequently produce, will undergo proliferation and produce um, interferon gamma, which will then subsequently um, help with the clearance of the intracellular pathogen. In this case, what will happen is the TH1 cell will provide help to the CD8 cell. And of course, the CD8 cell is very specialized for viral response. On the other hand, if the dendritic cell has picked up an exogenous antigen, such as a bacteria, it will present the antigen to the naive, C, naive CD4 T cell, activate it, and produce growth factors to instruct that T cell, look, there's an exogenous uh, bacterial infection in our body. You need to differentiate into a TH2 cell. Okay, so the... the, the the dendritic cell produces those growth factors, say IL-4, and that tells the T cell to differentiate into a TH2 cell. Now, in differentiating into a TH2 cell, it then undergo a process of proliferation to get enough cells to respond to the antigen, and it will then provide help to B cells, because B cells are very good uh, at, at dealing with bacterial infection as they produce antibody which will help opsonize bacterial uh, components and remove them. So the TH2 cell produces IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, which will help provide help to a B cell to remove the, the bacterial antigen. If we have an infection at the mucosal surface, um, say at the gut or the lung, the dendritic cell will come along, step, activate the T cell and say, you need to differentiate into a TH17 cell. There has been a breach at the mucosal surface and we need uh, a mass influx of, of neutrophils and other phagocytes to deal with this and fix the mucosal injury. So it produces IL-6, IL-21, um, IL-23, but the main growth factor that, that causes this differentiation is IL-23. And that causes the T cell to differentiate into a TH17 cell. TH17 cell will then provide help to the mucosal injury and cause mass inflammation of neutrophils, monocytes, um, and a whole range of other immune cells to help fix, help eliminate the pathogen and fix the, the mucosal barrier. Now, the problem with TH17 is it can, if it becomes dysregulated, it can contribute to autoimmunity, okay? But in general, it will provide help in a mucosal um, 
I mean, causal um, disruption and cause mass inflammation of those cells. Now, another option is if the dendritic cell picks up antigen, that's either self-antigen or if it's antigen that's generally harmless and does not require any uh, strong degree of inflammatory response, then it will instruct the T cell to differentiate into a regulatory T cell or a Treg cell. In that case, it'll produce IL-2 and TGF beta-1. Um, and that'll cause it to differentiate in the Treg. And the Treg will subsequently produce cytokines that will shut off the localized immune response in re uh, related to this relatively harmless antigen. Okay, folks? So that's the process that's involved in the initiation of the adaptive response. Antigen presentation to a CD4 helper T cell, and then the construction of what is the most uh, what is the most um, appropriate helper response depending on the antigen that or the pathogen that we're dealing with. Okay, and this is supposed just a summary, a very simplified summary of what happens when you have the Th1 and Th2 response. So, and um, the dendritic cell activates the T cell. Um, causes IL-12 release if it's a viral infection, which will cause the cell to differentiate into the TH1 cell. TH1 cell will then self-renew or undergo the process of growth <coughs> by, by producing IL-2. And that IL-2 will be released by the, the TH1 cell and bind the receptors on the TH1 cell, which will cause mass proliferation of the TH1 cell, okay? Um, and, and that's that process. It'll also produce interferon gamma to inhibit the, the production of TH2 cell, okay? Likewise, the, uh, in a TH2 response, the dendritic cell presents the antigen, and that will cause the, the T cell the naive T cell to differentiate into a TH2 cell. That TH2 cell will then produce IL-4, which will be released and bind on receptors on the outside um, to cause mass proliferation of the TH2 cell. And it will also produce IL-4, which will inhibit the differentiation in the TH1 cell. So there's a whole process um, of controlling the differentiation of TH1 and TH2 cells. Another important factor to consider, folks, just to make things a little bit more complicated, is that in any given immune response, it, it doesn't involve all naive T cells differentiated in Th1 or all differentiated in Th2. What you tend to find is you'll have, for instance, in a viral response, you'll have a Th1 dominant, predominant response, or in a bacteria, Th2 predominant response. You will have some small components of TH2 or TH17, for instance, but it will be a predominant TH1 response. And this idea of trying to control uh, the proportion of TH1 cells produced or TH2 cells produced is controlled by this negative feedback process. Now, so that's how we initiate the adaptive response, and that's how we choose the most appropriate immune response well, the most appropriate helper response. Now I want to deal with this concept of tolerance, okay? We dealt with it before um, uh, in terms of T cell differentiation. But we also have tolerance that occurs after T cell maturation. And this is basically to prevent T cells that have left the thymus, or bone marrow, in this case the thymus, T cells that have left the thymus that are still self-free active, we have a we have a process outside the the thymus that will that's almost like a security blanket. So that if it, if we do get self-reactive T cells that escape, that we have a way of suppressing them or stopping them, uh, causing an auto-reactive response. One of these response one of these mechanisms is energy, and this is where a T cell. Uh, gets presented, for instance, to a self-antigen and gets signal one, but doesn't get signal two. 
If that cell gets signal one, i.e. that the, the T cell receptor has bound to antigen presented on NHC, but it doesn't get um, signal two, that, that CD28 B7, then at that point, if it gets signal one but not signal two, it is rendered aner anergic. What that means is that T cell, if, this pro if that does happen, this T cell will never respond against self Well, sorry, will never respond against that antigen again. So essentially, an anergic T cell is a useless T cell. Another aspect of peripheral tolerance where we can stop an autoreactive response is the use of regulatory T cells. Regulatory T cells can help prevent the escalation of an immune response against an antigen that's harmless or against self antigen. Okay, so it help, helps to downscale the immune response after, uh, after uh, helps to successfully eliminate immune response against self antigen to prevent autoimmunity. It can also help in part to, to downregulate the immune response when the, the organism has been eliminated. Okay, so this is energy, again, where you get signal one and signal two that's required for T-cell activation. And then in an anergic um, situation, what will happen is, if you get uh, CD28 binding to B7, then you'll get, you'll have no effect on the T-cell, okay? Because those, those type of bindings can happen randomly anyway. But if the other way, if you get signal 1 but no signal 2 or T-cell receptor bending but no CD28B7 bending, then that will render the T-cell anergic. And of course, once it's anergic, that T-cell will never respond against antigen. In terms of T-cell suppressor activity or um, uh, regulatory T-cell activity, what will happen is you'll get you'll get signal 1, but in replacement of CD28B7 binding, you'll get CTLA present on the regulatory T cell binding to B7. And when that binding happens, it causes suppression of the CD4 cell response. Okay, folks, so that's the general concept of T cell, uh, T -cell maturation, T cell activation, and of course, the processes to protect the T cell against autoimmunity.